long time listeners or, or viewers of the show will recognize you from your, your first appearance. So welcome back to your second appearance on the Freedom Pack podcast, Neil. I'm delighted to be back with you. I remember enjoying our chat and I've got every reason to expect that I'll enjoy this one just as much. Amazing. Yeah, one of my favorites I've ever done, actually. And I wanted to, to start this podcast by saying that I thoroughly enjoy uh, your Twitter account. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> accounts on the platform, most notably at the moment because of these letters you're receiving. I mean, I look at some of the, you know, the addresses on there. I mean, could you just explain to people what's going on with these letters? And I encourage them after they've, after they've <laughs> viewed this to go and check some of them out because part of me doesn't believe it's real. <laughs> It, it started uh, It started a few months ago, I think it was back in July, actually, last year, about the middle of the year, um, and I received a, a letter, just a you know, standard white envelope, and the address was something to the effect of uh, Neil Oliver, a uh, TV archaeologist, lives near Stirling Castle in a postcode where you get in for free, okay? Stirling, Scotland. And I had written in a book about the fact that Stirling Castle, because of where we live in Stirling, there's an old tradition that we're close enough to the castle that we, that we, out my family qualifies to get in without paying the the the, the entrance fee. Like 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 hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people that live in this area. Uh, so that so this person had used that to sort of identify me for the post. So that came. And I I took a, I was so chuffed with it. I took a photograph of it and put it out on uh, on my Twitter account, and it got tens of thousands, I got twenty odd thousand likes or whatever. Um, and then it all went it all went quiet. But the, a few weeks ago, into twenty twenty one, this is where are we now? March, end of March. I don't know. Back in maybe January, February, another one came similarly with my name on it, but just describing me as a history guy and. I don't know, all round good chap or something. And it, it came and I, I was putting up photographs of them and it, what had been a, what's been a trickle uh, has come into something quite, so some days I get maybe 10 uh, and, there, and people are now obviously having fun with it. So sometimes it's a, they've got a photograph of me from whatever, a magazine or from the internet and they put that on and, you know, our, our postman's great. We've, <laughs> we know our postman and he's, He's, uh, he's latched on to what's going on at the moment. And so all these fantastic uh, letters and cards are just coming in, it, in inside the envelope. Some of them have beautiful artworks on them. And yes, I urge people to go and have a look at them on, on my Twitter account. Uh, and inside they're just lovely letters of, of support. People saying that they enjoy things that I've had to say on on radio or or, or on Twitter and and, uh, and just saying that they, that they share my point of view and that they're happy to hear that point of view being aired in public. And it's... So it's been lovely. I've got a whole basket of them. They're just over there, actually. I've, I've, I've kept every single one. So there's, I don't know, there's 40 or 50 letters now. You have a, a particular thing. I did see that a guy tried his hand at just writing Neil Oliver. I'm not sure that one will reach you. But the, you have a... Yeah, I, there's a few. Uh, people are also sit, tweeting me photographs of them posting my, the, the envelope. And some of them haven't come. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's some sort of missing in transit. Um Oh, there's just lovely ones. I mean, some people have got to so much trouble drawing. You know, people with an artistic talent, let's say, you know, have gone to a great deal of trouble to, to do little illustrations of me and my dog, Gracie, my Irish wolfhound, and other other identifying landmarks, Stonehenge or a castle or whatever. And it's just an absolute, it's just an absolute treat because... I, you know, if I, I get a lot of, um, you know, I get a lot of, uh, you know, abuse online, mm. like so many people do, uh, about one thing and another. Um, but you know, to send a, you know, a cruel, uh, you know, t tweet is the stuff of seconds. Anyone can send abuse to anybody. You know, you send abuse to the prime minister or the president of the United States of America or whatever. It takes seconds. But to write a letter takes time, and then to put it in the envelope, decorate the envelope. Then it's, you know, you've got to go out to find a post box or get to the post office and put a stamp on it. And it's a real commitment. <laughs> it's taking time, somebody taking proper time to, yeah. to get in touch with me. So everyone's a, everyone's a joy. There we are. I encourage everyone to check that out. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And lately I've been, I've been thoroughly enjoying your appearances on, on platforms like talk radio and the way you, you cover some topics. I, th I think it's fantastic. I personally tried to digest uh, a sort of wide spectrum of 
um, political commentary from the from the left to the right and pretty much anything in between to try and get a good perspective on everything. Um, so in in that vein, I, I you know a, a big talking point at the moment. I'd love to get your initial reaction if you have any to the to the events that happened on on Sunday in Bristol. What was your initial reaction like to that when you when you saw it unfolding? Uh, well, the, I mean, uh, uh, violence against the police, I just, I, I don't understand at, at all. I, I mean, I, like most people, I'm sure many people over the years, I have personally needed the police, you, you know, for, for a variety of things over the years. Um, and, and I've always had great uh, help and reassurance from the police. Uh, and, that, and that's purely a, a personal feeling. And, and all my life, I suppose I was just brought up and raised to respect, to respect the police. Um, and and the, this, that tradition of policing by consent and the fact that, you know, broadly speaking, our police are not armed. Obviously there's armed police, but your average uh, policeman or woman on the street is not. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I believe in the, in the police and I, I absolutely would always, you know, condemn just violence targeted against the police. I've been shocked, really, at, 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 I think, at, at what the, sometimes what the police have been asked to do. Uh, I think the, the police have been put in a, up and down the country, constabularies and the Met and whatever, I think they've been put in, in, a, in a hopeless and invidious position from time to time on account of uh, decisions that have been taken for them by, um, you know, by, by, by parliament and by government and all the rest of it. And, and the, the police don't get to pick and choose what uh, laws that they, they have to enforce. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel for the police that, that, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, like uh, from time to time, you know, there'll be a, there'll be a bad apple. Uh, uh, like in any profession, I suppose you'll get people that, that do the wrong thing, whether they're in uniform or not. But, you know, I, I support the, you know, I support the police wholeheartedly. And I think anyone that, that talks about defunding the police or, or doing away with the police force is, well, just deluded. We, we can't have a functioning society without them. So I, I was horrified at that, but I'm also, I'm very troubled by, uh, you see, you said that when you were introducing that question, you know, that you listen to comment from the left and the right and the middle, and so do I. And, and I'm very much just uh, motivated, but I'm, I'm completely, well, fascinated by what's going on. I can't believe my eyes. And so I'm consuming a, a, a great deal of information, written, video, whatever, desperately trying to keep a, uh, you know, keep a handle on what's, what's occurring up and down the country. Um, and I, I don't, I never have positioned myself as, as, as any kind of expert on matters political. I'm not a political person. I've never been, I've never joined a political party. I've never been a card carrying member. I'm, I'm, I've always been deeply cynical about politicians of, of, of every stripe. Uh, I, I always find it difficult to vote in general elections because there's, there's never anybody that properly appeals to me. I've never lived a day in Scotland under a government I've actually voted for. Not one day. <laughs> I've, always, I've always voted for the losing side, no matter what. So I, I don't consider myself to be an, an expert. I'm just interested. And I, I look on at things that are happening in terms of freedom of speech, uh, the right to protest, uh, the right to assemble. Uh, and I'm deeply troubled uh, and vexed by what I'm seeing, um, and and I think we're as a society we are going down a a, a dangerous path towards authoritarianism, uh, and our liberties have been stripped away from us, left, right, and centre over a very short space of time. I'm, I'm I'm shocked by the extent to which I think so many people don't seem to either they haven't noticed or haven't digested the significance of what is actually happening, or they have and they don't care. And I find all of that uh, deeply worrying. I mean, when it comes to protests, I believe in the right to protest, but there's also limits to that. You, you know, there have to be. You know, you can't just stand outside somebody's house bellowing abuse at them for hour after hour, day after day. You know, or or congregate somewhere and and, and not be challenged about having been there long enough, and that you you know you've now got to move on. You, everything has to function within reasonable. It, it requires reasonable behaviour on both sides. Uh, so on the one hand, where I've been, I've been shocked at uh, watching police kneel down for certain protests or run away from other protests and then appear to get very heavy handed with others. It hasn't been an attractive look, but it's a mess of politicians making, I think, and the, and the police have, have been caught square in the middle of it. 
um, damned if they do, damned if they don't, as many people have said. Yeah, it's interesting because you said, just like me, you, you consume a lot of content across the spectrum. And, and one thing that I've been, you know, struck by lately is the different narratives that seem to come out of the same situation. So when the events were unfolding, I, I you know, the, the, I followed the plausible narrative that, you know, these, these protesters were attacking the police. And then, you know, I, I look on some media channels and, and, and some uh, accounts on Twitter and there's this other narrative going that, you know, that, that the police actively place their vehicles in certain places to, to provoke the attacks, to make it easier, to, to spin the story. And there's so many narratives that go along with every um, incident like this. How do we even know, like, how do we navigate what narrative to follow? I agree 100%. I'm very wary as well because I, 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 I arrived, I came to the conclusion of the understanding relatively late in the day because, you know, I realised that I had been, you know, naively just uh, believing what I was seeing all the time. And uh, much more, well, relatively recently, I've realised that sometimes a bit of video or a, or a photograph has been manipulated. It's possibly not even f video footage of the event that it claims to portray. It's been taken from some other, especially things like protests and aerial photographs of columns of people moving through familiar landmarks and all the rest of it. And you, you, you think that you've, you're seeing something that is what it, what it portrays itself as. And then, and so all the time now, as I'm looking at photographs and images, I'm constantly trying to second guess and think, is that real? Is that actually a photograph that was taken at that event? Is that footage of what it actually uh, is, is being, uh, as it's being advertised? So, uh, yes, I, I share that uh, constant concern all the time that I'm, I'm becoming less and less confident of fewer and fewer sources of information. And, and sometimes, like you, I find that I'm running from one platform to another, trying to weigh up the, the likelihood that what I saw in the first one is true. Mm. And, and, and I don't just take images now at, at, um, at face value. Uh, and it, it's, I find that a very worrying aspect. I'm, I'm very suspicious of, of the motivations of a lot of mainstream media. Uh, I, I think a lot of the legacy media has, has uh, whether willingly or unwillingly, has, has seemed to uh, uh, migrate into being more of a uh, you know, a publicity machine for the for the governments, or, or, or circulating what I would class as propaganda, to some extent. And I'm very grateful for all the all the podcasts, like you know, like your own platform and everything else, where you think you can at least uh, go looking for many many different points of view, uh, and you can start making assessments based on you know how how many times you see the same thing repeated or hear the same statement made, and it becomes you think well perhaps that is credible now because I'm hearing it from a left-wing commentator and a right-wing commentator and, and so on and so on but yeah it's becoming a real uh, I mean it, it messes with a person's head because you, you look at something think it must be true because you used to just rely on you used to assume that if it was on a screen and it was masquerading as news that it was factual and th those days that certainty has gone mm -hmm. and now I find myself cross-referencing everything and, and sometimes never finally get into the to, to, to feeling that I really properly I'm in command of accurate information and I just you know shake my head and move on yeah. it's interesting because I mean there was a point where we you know we would follow facts but it, it seems like in the especially in the age of social media now it seems that you know more powerful than facts as, as we mentioned can be like an emotive picture and some poetic language I guess retweeted a hundred thousand times, and then it changes the narrative. So we're approaching a point now in where language is becoming more more powerful than facts. Do you think? I don't know about. Um, it's certainly being. Uh, it's becoming a different uh, language. I think is being misused a lot of the time. I think words are being driven into uh, meaninglessness. You know, words like. You know, when I was growing up, when I was at school, I'm 54, and when I was I was at school 30 odd years ago, or left school 30 odd years ago, and I, I knew what a fascist was. I, I had an understanding of what fascist and fascism meant. And I've seen that word just pounded and pounded and pounded now to the point where anyone can be called a fascist. Anyone that, that someone else doesn't agree with mm. becomes a fascist. Uh, racist, 
is a is a difficult word now. I I used to have a fairly straightforward understanding of what I thought racist meant, but that has now become hopelessly complicated and diluted to the point where there are now there are now words that I just I'm very careful when I read them, and, I, and to some extent I try not even to pepper my own speech with them because I'm aware that they mean different things to different people. And if you if you use a word like fascist now, it means, depending on who you are, depending on who your audience is, it, it, it conjures into being in their heads a different, a different thing than what I would mean if I said fascist. And even concepts like the left and the right, I, I find I, I've never been political, as I said before, I've never, I've never been a, a uh, you know, a follower of any particular political ideology, always been suspicious of them right across the board. But now I see that I'm being described quite often as somebody of the far right. Uh, and now, so now right wing and far right is really what I would have, even five years ago, would actually have considered to be of the centre. So something, something has moved so dramatically away from me that I, well, you know, as I say, I now routinely get categorised as someone of the extreme far right, <laughs> and I've always, I've always, I still con consider myself to be someone who's got pretty much centrist, centrist views about most things. Mm -hmm. So now, now I look at now when I see someone being described as of the left or a leftist or or of the right or far right, I, I almost just don't. I just, sort of, you know, I redact those words, if you like. There's another word that we've all become familiar with now, redacting. I had to look redacting up the first time I started reading it, you know, in, in recent times. I'd never encountered this concept of, you know, the blacking out of, of, uh, of passages and words in a document, this, this redaction that goes on. And, but now sometimes when I'm looking at a thing and I see someone being described as left or right, I just think, well, I don't know, do I? I can't, I don't know what they mean by that. And so I think language itself is becoming... I mean, language, somebody, a lot of people, you know, I'm very passionate about language. You know, I write, uh, I write books and I write articles for, uh, you know, for, for newspapers and other publications. And I read, you know, I read fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction and I read broadly. I read across a wide range of subjects. I'm very passionately in love with language and, and its power. Uh, and I do worry that, uh, that, that language is being... Uh, messed with and, uh, and, and and certain words are just being devalued to the point where I can't use them. We mentioned um, Bristol at the top of this topic and is Douglas Murray, a uh, former guest of this show in his book, The Madness of Crowds, he talks about Portland and being uh, the sort of epicenter of, of crowd madness in America um, you know, friend of our show, Brett Weinstein, spoken on it, he lives there, he knows First time. Are we and I've seen a lot of people making comparisons online, but are we are we ready to say that Bristol is the Portland of the UK? Well, uh, I I would sincerely hope not. Um, I've never visited Portland, um, mm. but I have visited Bristol many times. I know, I know people. I've got friends who live in in Bristol, and I've I've always had happy associations with Bristol and the West Country and. I mean that whole that whole part of, of of the of the southwest of of England is you know is very close to my heart for all sorts of reasons and um uh, and you know Bristol's beautiful and it's got so much such a story to tell and uh you know it has it has featured in the story of Britain you know spread across you know centuries and it I would I, I would definitely I would balk at the at the mere thought that it was going to uh, that it could be that it could start to be being uh, you know, uh, bracketed alongside the kind of troubled events we've seen in places like Portland and, and Seattle. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I mean, the, the, the Southwest, the, the West country has always been a place of dissent. If, you know, anyone who's read a bit around English, British history, you know, religious dissent and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it has, has been there, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the revolution, the attempted revolution that culminated in the Battle of Sedgemoor, you know the, the the dissent that came out that, that was able to be um, uh, capitalised upon by the by a, a, a usurper to the uh, to the to the British throne. You know, landed in the West Country deliberately, knowing that there would be a hotbed of people with a, an alternative worldview. Let's say so. It's got a history of of cradling, <laughs> you know, confrontational thought. 
that's part of that's part of what the Bristol and and, and places in this and in, in this in this West Country are, are all about. But uh, that that it, that that people could contemplate it's descending into that kind of lawlessness that we keep on seeing in the Antifa protests. Uh, mm -hmm. That'd be that'd be a dreadful tragedy. We've um, we've mentioned things like defunding the police and, and and things like that and you know cancel culture wokeism all in, in general. I think that you know I like to believe that they at least even though I I think that a lot of them are wrong. I like to at least think that they're coming from a place of of care. They're coming from a place of wanting to see a better world. Um, I don't think these you know. Uh, the majority of the people just want to see the world burn. I think they do actually care. They just maybe go about it in the wrong way. Um, but in that sense, do you think on the whole that we're encouraging the world that we, we actually want to see? No, I don't at the moment. Um, uh, I'm like you, I'm, I, I, I cling sometimes by my fingertips to the, to the belief that people are basically fine. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as, I mean, there are no good or bad people everyone is, has the potential to be both and most people are, are moved from one to the other during the course of a single day uh, you know you just each of us has the potential to do good things or or to do bad things um, and I'm always I'm always suspicious about people's bios on Twitter and, and, and elsewhere when, when, when people describe themselves as being motivated by love and kindness and they've got hearts everywhere I, that, that actually starts alarm bells ringing for me because I think I think some people have, have a wildly overinflated idea of their own goodness yeah. and that, and they can be and they can trick themselves and possibly some others into believing that they only act out of the best of motives and th there are definitely plenty of, of movements out there that have been infiltrated by bad actors uh, and, and, and people who uh, have a have an, an, an ideology uh, a worldview and they will pick up anything and use it as a weapon. You know, they'll, they'll use anything. And, and people's completely reasonable people's completely understandable sensitivities about accusations of, say, racism or, or homophobia or Islamophobia or misogyny. I mean, people are understandably desperately fearful about being labelled thus because it can be personally and professionally ruinous you know, to, to be to have certain labels hung around your neck, and and I think that too many uh, groups and movements have been infiltrated by those who have weaponized language in that way that we've we've already partly discussed, and and that and that people are are being completely silenced and driven out of the debate, and driven out of discussion because it's just too dangerous. Mm. It, it's now impossible for most people to publicly make statements that five years ago would have been regarded as perfectly reasonable. And for most people, the fear of the ruin that they might bring down upon themselves simply by entering the debate and, and, and having the temerity to say something other than the, the prescribed orthodoxy. So no, I don't think we're at the moment, we're definitely not creating the world that oh, well, I would have wanted. Um, you know, I believe, in, I believe in freedom of speech you know, as, as I've mentioned before, you know, I get, I, from time to time, uh, there's torrents of abuse that I, that come my way. And I, you know, I don't go looking for it. So I don't always see it, but, you know, people keep me pretty up to date with things that are being said about me. And I don't tackle it because I, I just think, well, you know, if, if there are people out there who don't actually know me and they've decided that they hate me, <laughs> well, you're fair enough. That is, an, that's an aspect of, just that's just life isn't it and um and I just I, I just put up with that because I would I would rather that people were free to say the most appalling things than go to the other extreme which is everyone being too frightened to say anything you, you know so I would I would I'm prepared to put up with a lot of the things that I do put up with because I would I would rather it be that way uh, because you know people can say and think what they like about me as long as it's only you know sticks and stones and all that. Yeah. Um, so I don't mind it. But you know, in answer to your question, I, I don't think we're we're creating the sort of world that I would want for my children because freedom of speech, freedom of expression, has been severely disabled. It's my front doorbell. It's Good. seriously. No, it's someone else will get it. Sorry, oh, seriously. Freedom of speech has been seriously compromised. Um, 
And uh, worse than that, when it comes to our civil liberties, I think on account of the restrictions that have been put in place uh, under the umbrella of, of lockdown and COVID-19, we've already in just a year moved 180 degrees from, from the sort of world I would like to live in, which is, the, which is the Britain that I grew up in, which is to say a Britain where I was allowed by law to do pretty much anything I wanted unless it was prescribed by a specific law. Mm. Everything else was, was allowed. And now it feels as if nothing is allowed unless there's a specific permission from government, from the powers that be. And that's, that's through the mirror. That's, that's through the, into the looking glass world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, want, I want to be free to do whatever I want and I want to be free to say whatever I want unless there's you know, a specific law pr pr preventing me from you know, using certain language in, in public discourse and all the rest of it. But it's gone the other way now. And it, it, it's, it, it, when it comes to speech, it, it now becomes increasingly, it feels increasingly that there are now just, um, uh, increasingly there are uh, forms of words that you're expected to use. We're, we're not quite at compelled speech, but it feels as if we're moving in that direction. And I find that very, very troubling. Yeah, it, it means a lot to me hearing you talk about that because I mentioned like on this show, I, I speak to people from the from the left, I speak to people from the right, I, I try my best and and I, I sometimes speak to to quite contra seen as controversial people um, that I don't. Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'll speak to I recently spoke to Dave Rubin, for example, very outspoken guy. Um, me and Dave spoke beforehand. I told him I don't agree with a lot of what he says. Um, he doesn't agree with a lot of what I think, but we're still able to have a conversation. The same yeah. with Douglas Murray, and there's been countless guys. But yeah, yeah. even though I express that I don't you know, necessarily agree with what they say, I've received some messages um, you know, with people you know, saying some horrible things to myself, not because of anything I said, but because I had a conversation with someone. Um, so what, what advice would you, would you give? Because I think in the past, or when, maybe when I first had my first one or two instances of this, it made me almost think to myself, oh, maybe I should stop. But then, you know, what advice would you give in that regard? Well, don't. My advice is don't stop. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of well rehearsed lines a lot of well rehearsed lines about um to the effect of you know if you're not upsetting some people then you're not doing your job mm. certainly in what you're doing you know you're being a i don't know how you describe exactly what it is that you do but an on-screen journalist let's say or a mm. video journalist would you know but would perhaps be a reasonable description of some of what you do yeah. Uh, and if you're not upsetting people and attracting some, you know, even savage criticism, then you're probably not doing it right. And if you are getting people saying, "You, how dare you do this? And how dare you give your time to so-and-so? Well, you, you have to take that as a badge of honour because you, anyone that seeks to silence you and, and, and tries to dictate to you the kind of people that it's appropriate for you to talk to, that's just completely out of order. I mean, that's... that's that's why that 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 completely intolerable potential state of affairs is why people like you know Joe Rogan. Hmm. I mean, he's been at it for such I don't know is it ten years or something. He's yeah. been he was put, at least so he was right out there ahead of the ahead of the wave, and and he and he demonstrated a number of things, but particularly the fact that long form conversations are actually hypnotic for people far from this notion that people are only interested in a few minutes, a soundbite of the kind of thing that you hear on breakfast television where someone's supposed to, you know, make an argument in, the, in that's my wolfhound uh, <laughs> howling there. Uh, you know, people come on and they just try to make an argument in two minutes. It, it, it's hopeless. Whereas, you know, the, that kind of long format, uh, three uh, hours of conversation between two or three people and you properly, by the end of it, you think, yes, I've actually had the opportunity to hear that person think out loud, uh, sometimes to change their, their, their opinion and, and, and be modified by the thing, by the conversation that they're having. And likewise, the likes of Joe Rogan has had everyone on, you know, mm. some of the most controversial figures. I've listened to hours and hours and hours of it. And some people that he's had on have driven me up the wall, you know, been ready to, you know, take a swing at the screen. And other people, I, you know, I completely agree with. Other people just leave me cold. 
but he's taken the trouble to give uh, the oxygen of of conversation to everyone. Just just a few of the names that you were name checking there yourself. You know the fact that you've spoken to Douglas Murray and Brett Weinstein, and they, they're people that I've seen them talk, uh, or, you know, on Joe Rogan, and I've seen them talk together in other instances, and they don't agree, and they don't always agree with Joe Rogan, and and uh, but the whole the whole point of of conversation. I mean, is there anything more anodyne and pointless than just having a conversation all the time with people that you agree with? It's great fun to have a to feel that you're simpatico with somebody that you're talking to from time to time, and it, you know, and it, you know, it reinforces your maybe your sense of belief and your sense of confidence. But it's also fantastic to be completely challenged by somebody that you know that, that that's completely the polar opposite view. And if, you, if you're prepared to listen, even grudgingly, you usually think well, actually you know you scored a point there and or, or, or at the very least you expressed that view eloquently and that was well articulated I don't maybe agree with you but you you know you painted a word picture for me there that I was able to get and I understand mm -hmm. you I don't agree with you but I get you and, and this th th this appetite that seems to be out there you know where people are being deplatformed by students and universities and all the rest of it because it would be too dangerous for them to listen to this person speak that way sterility lies um you know and if you you know if you plow the fields with salt you know it's like it's like carthage you know just nothing grows and you know these places like the you know like, like university campuses which should be the most fertile ground where anything and everything might grow will just become these sterile wastelands where there's nothing yeah i mean we've seen instances of of you know, people trying to be cancelled this year. I mean, Jordan Peterson, I mean, the Penguin employees tried to get his book uh, deal taken away. Um, what are you doing in publishing if you're trying to, if, you're, if you've also got some of the mindset of a book burner, which is basically what they are? You know, what are you doing in publishing? You're, you're, I mean, publishers, I, um, um, uh, I, uh, I've had some books published by uh, Widenfield and Nicholson. Mm. That's one of the imprints that I've been published by. And and, and, uh, and Mr. Widenfield was famously published people that he didn't agree with because it was the it was his obligation, not his job, it was his obligation. You know, so yes, he sometimes put stuff out there that he, he agreed with, but he also published. I can't think off the top of my head now some of the famous controversial examples of that, but publishing, you're supposed, you, you should be fired by the, by the, the, the desire, the passion to, to, to get as many ideas out there where they can be considered in the bright light of day. If you... If you stop people saying things, they don't stop thinking them. Mm. I mean, that's mistake number one off page one. You know, just thinking that you can, oh, well, as long as they don't say that, they've now stopped thinking it. No, they don't. It just, it just becomes internalised and they just they maintain that idea, but now you don't know where they are. It's like, with, especially with particularly, you know, where there are dangerous and pernicious ideas or, you know, you'd want to know where they are. It's like if you know there's a rat in your house, you know the problem is if you can't see the thing. You know you want you want to you want out. You want out where you can where you can see and deal with ideas. Not silencing. Don't silence. Don't no platform anyone. That's that's madness. Let their let them be let them be um, exposed and and diminished by their own words, not by having their words taken from them. A good mainstream example of this, again, someone who I probably, you know, again, I agree with a lot of what he says, a lot of what he says, you know, sparks a bit of anger in me, but at least I was aware that either way it made me have conversations and, and you know, think for myself is when we saw recently Piers Morgan. Uh, get, I knew you were uh, going to see Piers Morgan. <laughs> hey, I got to bring him up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is a mainstream a mainstream example and a, and a, and a big one. Um do you think that does that in, what does that tell you about the way we're heading? Do you, do you think that that's a, a was that a damaging thing to see happen? Do you think uh, to see Pierce sacked, mm. if indeed, well, part company? I don't know exactly what the what happened behind closed doors. Let's say parted company with with um, ITV and, and Good Morning Britain. Well, a, a madness. Uh, uh, um, he, he is he's, he's the alpha dog mm. of that show, where he was. I, I mean. He, he must have been paying all of their wages, you know, the kind of advertising revenue that 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 he would attract to that to that slot. You know, advertisers want their products in amongst 
uh, you know, shows that have got big audiences and he, he was your audience right there. And so that was biting the hand that fed them, all of them. Um, and in, in any event, you know, he, that, he, he's a genius at what he does. He's, a, he's, a, he's an inflammatory, controversial, uh, Marmite figure that some people love and some people hate. And, and a lot of people that hated him were still tuning in so that they could be, you know, enraged by him. That's that's what you get with a performer like uh, Piers Morgan, and they've entertained these various views down through the years, and then all of a sudden he says one thing about one person, and that's you can't say that about that person. Well, he said everything else about everyone, or he's had his opinion about everything else. Why is he, why is he suddenly not allowed to have his opinion about that person, uh, and and then just to be dismissed as a again, you know, as, 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 as a racist or, or however it was that he was being categorised, I, I, I just couldn't understand it. He, uh, like you, well, I mean, he's driving me, I, don't, I didn't watch GMB latterly, not for a long time, because I found him too, <laughs> too enraging. But more power to his elbow. For every Piers Morgan, there's, with his points of views, there should, as long as there's plenty of other people with, the, you know, the, the opposite and the alternative point of view, well, that's fine. You, why do you want to just listen to people all the time that you agree with? What kind of kind of bland diet is that? If you're just eating, you know, cheese sandwiches all the time, you've got to spice it up with something. Well, they've they've tried to to keep it spicy by bringing in Ben Shepherd as his replacement. They uh, not sure how spicy Ben will be. Well, you, you know, Piers Morgan. If you if you employ Piers Morgan, heavens above, I mean he's. By the time GMB were employing Piers Morgan, you know exactly what you're going to get. And, and he did the job that he was employed to do. You know, he boosted the ratings, boosted the figures, and, and he, was a, you know, he, he managed to make GMB a talking point once a week, every week. Mm. Why would you do away with that? One thing I'd, I'd, I'd love to get your uh, thoughts on, or if we could first just define her and explain it, because I think you're probably in a, in a better position to explain it to people, but the Scottish government's hate crime bill, before we get into that, could you explain just to people who may not be aware what that is and, and what that means? Well, I'm no lawyer, um, so I'm not, a, I'm not across the legal minutiae of it, but it basically it was, um, it was, it was an attempt to, to pull together, I believe, certain disparate uh, uh, laws and uh, and legal paperwork, uh, you know, around uh, uh, dealing with things that were, that were said about people, whether there were matters of religion, uh, matters of sex, matters of uh, sexual orientation, uh, uh, transgender, uh, everything, and and try, trying to pull it all together into one into one place. The the bill was put before was put out there for public uh, debate, as, as, as is the case with all of these, you know, before, a, before something becomes law, it, you know, it goes through a, a process of being aired and, and debated. And, and that, I, I, it was at that point that I became aware of it because the, the proposed, as it became known, the hate crime bill um, was vilified across the board and it, it united the strangest bedfellows, you know, you know people from, from, the, from the church, you know, uh, uh, lawyers for the legal fraternity, um, actors, comedians, authors, uh, all sorts of people were united in confederacy in saying this is badly worded, it's too vague, um, and it's going to, the net effect of it will be to stifle freedom of speech. And I thought, well, anything that, that, that all of those people, that otherwise unlikely assemblage of people, if, if all of them are agreed that this is bad for freedom of speech, then it must surely be bad for freedom of speech. And so I started watching it at that point. And one of the, one of the things that was particularly troubling was this notion of you could be accused of stirring up hatred on racial grounds or on sexual grounds. Um, and if, if, if I said something or say something in, or write something in even in London, I could say it in London, but because I, if it was heard in Scotland and, and a complainant was able to allege that, that they were offended by it, or indeed they felt that I was attempting to stir up hatred, then it, the, the, the burden of the obligation would be on, in, in my, on my part to prove that I hadn't meant to do any of that. You know, I would have to, I would have to, the, the burden of proof was mine to show that I hadn't meant to do that which I was accused of doing, rather than being 
convicted of having done it. It was a prima facie I had done it. If, that, if a person felt offended, then, then they were offended and I had to prove that I hadn't meant to do that. And some of it, some of it came with a, with a maximum term in prison of seven years. Now, as I say, you know, people with more with legal training, which I do not have, would, would be able to give you a more um, legalistic uh, uh, breakdown of why it was problematic. But the fact was that so many different groups spoke. The police, the police were part of saying we can't police this. You, you, you literally, you'd be, you, you'd be, uh, they will be processing allegations of, of offence and hate. You, you know, thousands and thousands every day, p potentially. All you got to do is phone the police and say that you heard somebody say something and, and it was hateful. But there were even, there were even a, a part of it was that uh, hypothetically, if I was to say something in my house at the dinner table one night uh, and maybe, maybe one of my children repeated it the next day, someone hearing what I had said in private in my house, I could be, I could be jailed for seven years for something that I said, you know, whatever in private, it, you mm. know, behind closed doors. Wow! But if it was, if it, if word of what I had said got out into the public domain by being repeated by by my child, say, then then that could be enough to see me up in court and and languishing at, at Her Majesty's, you know, pleasure. Mm. Um, and uh, but the, but it was the fact that so many people, so church bodies, religious groups, uh, the legal profession, the police. Uh, and then all the people from the sort of creative arts, actors, uh, authors, comedians, all these people saying, whoa, wow, you don't want to do this. And I thought, right, that's, that's got to be stopped. But, and I know that the act was amended in certain ways, but the act that has gone forward now, it's been through the consultation process, and the, the act that has gone forward now to, to obtain the royal assent and become law, Gracie, shush. The act that has gone forward to be, to be made law uh, is still deeply troubling for all of those aforementioned groups. So although some of it has been amended in some ways, all of the same groups that were troubled by the, the stifling effect that it would have on freedom of speech, uh, they're all, all the same people are, are still carrying all of the same concerns. Yeah, I mean, even though it's, you know, it's confined to Scotland, that it has sort of rung around the, the world and... and Jordan Peterson uh, described it as a the watershed moment in the culture wars. What what do you think he meant by that? Uh, I saw that. I, I saw as well. He had tweeted something about something to the effect of "Oh God, no, not Scotland." Yeah. <laughs> it was I think was his opening segue into that into that into that territory. I think you know obviously a, a place like Britain, let's say, and you know, and Scotland being a part of Britain. Uh, Britain is, has been known around the world as a bastion of uh, uh, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, tolerance of, of you know, of religious tolerance and, and every other sort of tolerance, you know, it's imperfect. But, you know, I, when, I hear, when I hear Britain being run down in any of those contexts, I always want to say, compared to where, you know, yeah, it's not perfect here, but it's, it's broadly speaking better here than it is anywhere else. Um, and so we've Britain and, and therefore Scotland have been bastions of bright lights of, of, of freedom, the freedom to speak, the freedom to express views, the freedom to write, criticism of p political parties and governments and, and all the rest of it. And, and I think, I think uh, Jordan Peterson meant if, if, if that's happening in a place like Britain, if that's happening in Scotland, then it can happen anywhere. You know, it's not like, you know, you, it, it, it was the sort of hate crime bill you'd expect in some sort of tin pot dictatorship or a banana republic. You know, and there are maybe certain places on the planet that you might expect some authoritarian, totalitarian dictator to bring forward. But someone like Jordan Peterson was looking and saying, oh, no, they're doing that in Scotland. And that his, his consternation, I thought, spoke volumes. Speaking of Scottish politics, I saw an article in The Sun um, by, uh, by Douglas Murray, actually. He said that the, I think he said the behaviour of the, quote, rotten Nicola Sturgeon and her party reeks. He said that the entire party is, is weak on principles now. Do you think he has a point from your point of view actually living and under that? Absolutely, yes. I think that there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the Salmond inquiry that has been grinding 
slowly forward for the last what seems like months or years. Uh, you know, has well one of the one of the reports, that, you know, the the report that came back from within Parliament was that uh, the first minister Nicholas Sturgeon had misled Parliament. Um, you know, which, which basically means that, that, as far as they were concerned, that you know that what the what the what the first minister had said was not to be trusted. That, that she had, I mean, it's, there can be hardly anything more damning than to have the first minister the, the the judgment come down that she had misled Parliament. But the whole process has shown that that um, that there's uh, there's corruption from from top to bottom. The the Parliament doesn't have the necessary powers to hold government to account. Uh, the separation of powers that's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, the, the essential component of, of, a, of a liberal democracy is not there. You know, so the, the, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary are supposed to be hands off one another. Mm. There's all, those three are, are, elements are supposed to operate, uh, you know, in, independently. But the the, the, the Salmond inquiry demonstrated that the Crown Office, which is the Scottish equivalent of the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, so the Crown Office in Scotland was being controlled by the government. So the, the, the separation of powers was not there. Uh, Scotland, the Scottish Assembly, the Scottish Parliament doesn't have a second chamber. It doesn't have a House of Lords or, or equivalent through which legislation can uh, you know, pass and be scrutinised again. Uh, th that was supposed to be the job of committees, but the committees that were, when the devolution settlement was being thrashed out, you know, at, you know, at, at the end of the 1990s, uh, that the, we were told that the, uh, the necessary committees would have all the teeth they required to, you know, fearlessly scrutinise the proposed legislation and the, and the behaviour of government. Well, they don't. They simply don't. And now the, now the feeling here is that the, that the SNP and the Scottish government is just a law unto itself, unchallenged. Uh, and it, and it, it's across the, the Scottish landscape without, uh, without, without fear of, you know, a meaningful challenge from any other source. We've talked uh, a lot in this podcast of, of things that uh, disappoint us, things that may evoke some anger in us. Um, so I'd, I'd love to sort of close this, this conversation by asking what things, because I think it's important because if you're always looking at life through, through that political lens, it can be tiring, it can bring you down. So for you personally, what ways do you manage to unplug and, and tune out from this kind of stuff when, you know, when, when it's got you feeling down, when it's got you feeling frustrated, what, what bring, what rejuvenates Neil Oliver? Well, um, I get a great deal of I get a great deal of profound reassurance from from the people who that I meet out. Here. I've got two dogs; they're both sleeping in here. But two Irish wolfhounds, and you know we walk them every day, and uh, we 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 bump into you know the, the same people over and over again. And uh, I'm 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 reassured by the common sense that almost all of those people speak with. You know, they don't. They don't all completely. They don't 100% agree with 100% of everything that I believe. Yes, Gracie. Um, but they, um, I, I'm reassured by their common sense. So I, I, I get, I get a great deal of comfort from just because that, 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 they're ordinary people, people from you know both sexes, all ages, um, whatever working class, middle class. You know, there's a whole broad church, let's say a broad congregation of people from all sorts of walks of life and. I talk to them and I think, no, you're pretty. Ninety-nine percent of you are sane, reasonable people. So, that, if if you inhabit a world of social media and, and, and Twitter is insane, and that platform is mad, and if you just live in there, you're 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 walking the halls of madness. But you, but you go out and walk the walk around with the dogs and you encounter just normal people. You open this this conversation with me, those um, letters that I've been getting from people from all over the all over the place. They're coming in from Europe, America as well, and every one of them lifts my spirits. I, I find I struggle to adequately articulate how much every single one of those uh, messages is meant because I, that reassures me that there's you know there's just regular nice folk out there with a sense of humour who, who are prepared to, you know, reach out and, and send a, a, you know, a positive message to someone they don't know. You know, they're, they're, they, you know they've, they've heard me or they've seen me, but, they, you know, they're not people that I know personally. And yet they've, you know, they, they reach out to me and say, you know, keep up the good work and, 
you know, you're speaking for us and we, you know, we're, we're very reassured by hearing you say what you say. So I get a great deal out of that. My dogs, it's cliched almost, but I get a, a huge amount of reassurance from, from them because no matter what's going on, lockdown, curfew, whatever, <laughs> the dogs just want to do the same thing. They don't care. They want out for a walk. They want, they want love and kindness and they want fed three times a day. And it, that, that gives every day a structure that's that's meaningful. It is. It's not. It's no, it's no small thing to be to have a, you know a couple of dogs you know looking to you for that you know that which they need during the course of a day is good for a person. Uh, and I read. Hmm. I read a lot. I don't watch a lot anymore. I'll be honest. Uh, television. I don't watch any terrestrial television really. Um, really, I don't. I watch. Uh, you know the the uh, the kids have got the Disney Channel. <laughs> Um, and we, you know, we watch Avengers movies and things, and you know, other whatever on there. And I, I, I watch, I, I suppose, a certain amount of things on like Netflix and some of the other big um, streaming platforms. But I don't watch telly, so I read, I read a lot, and I, I, I like, I like going. But I'm in. You can't really see them in here, but I've got shelves all around me here, and all my books from all the years. And I like reading books from more than twenty years ago that go back into a time that I, I don't know, that I seem to remember recognising more easily. <laughs> a, a, a world that I recognise more readily, uh, you know, is the world of the, maybe the 1990s <laughs> yeah. and the early noughties. I think some of, the, some of the recent stuff that's going on in the last few years, have, it's nice to go back and read books from another time mm -hmm. when the world made more sense to me. So for those watching or listening now, they, they you know, they, they want some more Neil Oliver. They want more from yourself. I would personally um, recommend uh, Wisdom of the Ancients, which we spoke about before. One of my favorite books I read in recent times filled me with a lot of, a lot of hope and inspiration. I, I really enjoyed oh, that one. But um, we've mentioned, I think you're on Twitter. You're the Coast Guy. Just let the guys know where they can find you. I'm on, yeah, I'm at the Coast Guy. Uh, I've also got a podcast of my own, uh, Neil Oliver's love letter to the British Isles, mm. um, you know, which which I've been doing for, I think there's something like 30 or 40 episodes out there now. I talked to a good friend of mine, Paul Ratcliffe. We go back a long way. He was the, he was the first director that I worked with in television, and, and now we do this podcast together, which is history and archaeology. I've got a Patreon site now as well, um, where I discuss things historical and archaeological, but also current affairs. Mm. So people can find me at uh, Neil Oliver you know, on, on the Patreon website, Neil Oliver. Uh, I've got an Instagram account, Neil Oliver Love Letter. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm as far as I can, as far as I can make the time, I'm, I'm, I'm out there on those platforms. Perfect. Um, I'll link that in the, in the show notes below. Uh, yeah, man, thanks so much for coming on again. I think it's been a, a really good conversation and one that's actually, you know, done a lot for me personally. It's reassured me about some things and I, and I really appreciate it. Me too. Me too. I enjoy talking to you and I will uh, happily look forward to our third encounter whenever that comes along. <laughs>